Okay. So I'll turn our attention up here, please. Alright, so um, we got a point, negative three six. Right there, and a point negative seven three. Right about there. And there's a line that goes through those two. That's what the direction you're saying. There's a line that goes through those two points. Okay, we want to find the slope. How does the slope? Like maybe you could use some other words to talk about what the slope has to do with this line. What is the slope describing about this line? Steepness, uh, slantiness. Right? Doesn't really have anything to do with where it is specifically, just how steep it is. And what is the slope? Not what is the number that is the slope for this problem, but in general, what's the slope of measure of? Got two numbers involved. What are those two numbers? How it rises and runs. What's that? How it rises and runs. Rises and runs. What? How high? If you're at one point, if you're at a point on a line, uh, and you go up so much, how far over do you have to go to get to another point on the line? Or how, if you go over this far, how far up do you have to go? It's a ratio of the vertical change from one point to another uh, versus the horizontal change from one point to another. Change in y divided by the change in x. Uh, okay, so we've gotten there. And now, in this example, specifically, how do we calculate the slope? How do we find, first, the vertical change? How do we find the change from here to there, straight up? The faster you participate, the faster counting you get through this. Okay, counting it. That would work, except for, let's say we don't have a picture of it, so or maybe we're going to add some good. Subtract what? Negative three from negative seven. Negative three from negative seven will give us the vertical change. What are these two numbers? This, this number is, is uh, why is it first? It's x. It's x. It's the input, right? Now, which one is x? It's horizontal, right? That's, so that would give us the run. the run, the horizontal change, the change in uh, uh, horizontally between one point and another point. So we can start there. All right, so you said negative 3 minus negative 7. Does it matter if we do negative 3 minus negative 7 or negative 7 minus negative 3? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that if we do that, if we take this to be the first one, negative 3, okay, and this to be second, then we need to do the same here. So this minus that means we need to do this minus that. And if we did it the other way around, we had to flip it. So that's the, what does this calculate again? Run. Or run, which is the horizontal change. Okay, then how are we going to find the vertical change? Be somewhat careful about this. Six minus three. Uh, six minus three. So we're making sure that you use six first, because we use negative three first, and minus three next. So six. This vertical height there, minus 3, should give us that much. 6 minus 3. So we got 3 over negative 3 plus 7 is 4. So we got 3 fourths. If we had flipped it and done 3 first, minus 6, or negative, and negative 7 minus negative 3, we would have gotten negative 3 over negative 4. But that's positive 3 fourths. Okay. So from here, up is 3, and over is 4. Rise over up. So you got these two lines in number 18, and we want to figure out if they're parallel or perpendicular or neither. If they're parallel, what will we find out with their slopes? The what? Same slope. Same slope. Uh -huh. Same slope. Okay, so that's good. Um, what if they're perpendicular? Reciprocals and negative. Negative of each other. So opposite reciprocals. So we won't go through all this. We'll just assume we all know what we're doing here. So negative 4 minus uh, a negative 1. So plus 1 is negative 3. And 6 minus 3 is 3. So negative 1. We say negative 1 over 1, so we have rise over run. And then this one. 7 minus 5 is 2. Negative 2 minus a negative 4. That's negative 2 plus 4. And it's 2. That's positive 1 over 1. So 
Are they parallel? No. They're not exactly the same, so no, they're not parallel. Are they perpendicular? Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. Because the reciprocal of one over one, if you flip it over, it's also one <coughs> over one. And they're opposites. Negative, opposite. So they're perpendicular. And if they were neither, they wouldn't be equal and they wouldn't be opposite reciprocal, they would be neither of those. Uh, You're going to assume that you all have uh, internalized the procedure of go down to negative 3 on the y-axis, then go up 3 and over 2, up 3 and over 2, and there's your other point, graph 1. Okay? So I'm going to assume that you've got that down. We did it in algebra. We refreshed our memory. We did pretty well in class the other day. And so now we're going to recover, go over again, why that is. Okay, so we'll start with the negative 3 part. Um, what are the coordinates of this point, this y-intercept? Zero, Zero, negative three. OK. So it's not negative three because we memorized it or it's magic, right? The y-intercept isn't negative three because we memorized it or it's magic. It's just what happens when we plug zero in for x. It's a really convenient point to find. Because if we put zero in for x, zero times anything is zero, and so all that's left is negative three. That happens. And with every equation that's in this form, right? What's this form called? Slope-intercept. Slope -intercept. If it's in slope-intercept, it's in a convenient form to find the y-intercept quickly. You put 0 in for x, negative 3 is all that's left. Or whatever it is, that's all that will be left when you plug in 0. So that's what we call the y-intercept, and that's easy to find. Okay? So we just need another point. Um, well, it turns out the next convenient point can be found with the slope of 3 and over 2. Okay. Well, why not this point? Why don't we go, why don't we find this point next? It takes long, too difficult, but it does take longer. It is not as convenient. Okay. What makes it easier to plot this point than say this point or this point or that one? Two whole numbers. Two whole numbers, right? Right on the grid. Right at the intersection of two lines on the grid. Um, so if we could find the next one that's on the grid, that would be great. Okay. So, right, so which x value should we move over to? Should it be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Okay. How do we know by looking at this after 0, after being at x equals 0, what the next easiest number to plug in for x is? What's an easy number to plug in for x here so that we don't get a not too difficult, but more difficult fraction. Yeah? One. One, okay, so we put in one. So three halves times one is three halves, minus three, so now you have to do a fraction, minus a whole number, right? Not impossible, but then we have to get common denominators, and then when we go to plot it, we have to plot it somewhere in between, like not at the mm -hmm. intersection of the grid. So perfectly fine, and do it if, if you think that that's easy, but would say it's not the easiest one. Mm -hmm. You say, Amy? Two. Two, why two? Mm -hmm. If you come over one, then the two would be fine. Yeah, if we put a two right there, I would argue that's easier, because if we put a two, that's, well, that's just two over one. Two cancels with two, and we're just left with three. Right. Three minus three, easy, zero. Three halves minus three, not as easy. Not difficult, really, but uh, not as easy. So. The next x value that's easy to plug in for x is 2. Okay, and it turns out we just add a 3 to negative 3. So we just go up 3 and over 2. What would be the next easy value to plug in for x? 4. 4. The next multiple of 2, the next number that would cancel out that 2 as well. Plug in 4. 4 cancels with 2, now we're left with 2. Now it's not 3 times 1, it's 3 times 2. Right? So we've already added 3. Went over 2, we're going to add another 3. Right? A total of six. And move over two. And we can just keep going up three and over two, up three and over two. So that's just that's where that slope idea comes from. Okay. Um, now, now this guy right here. You remember what 
this form is called? Standard. standard form. I don't know why it's called standard. This one's used pretty standardly, uh, more than this one's used. Okay. Um, after this section, we're probably never going to use this form again. But it doesn't hurt to see things in, in multiple forms when you first learn them. So my argument here was that these two points were some of the easiest to find. So we're going to, again, try to find the easiest points. We need to just find one point, x comma y, and another point, x comma y, and we can plot this so we can draw this line. So what's one point that's easy to find, and how do we find it? What's that? Plug in zero for x, how come that's so easy? Because it's a two x and then you just y. That's right. If you plug in zero for x, this goes away. Two times zero, easiest multiplication problem in the world you get zero. Negative 6y equals negative 12. So we put zero in for x. Negative 6y equals negative 12. Negative 6 divided by negative 6 on both sides, you get 2. That was easy. What's something else easy to do? 1. Maybe. One's not too difficult. You put 1 in for 2. Uh, then we'll get 2 times 1 is 2. Then we'll have to subtract 2 from both sides. We get negative 14. Then we'll have to divide 14 by negative, or negative 14 by negative 6, which doesn't come out too nicely. So. Not, it's not a wrong idea, it's just no. probably the three. one that's easier. What's that? Three. Three? Plug in a three? Into x? Yeah. Okay, so we plug in a three, we get two times three, we get six, we subtract six, we get negative 18, divide by negative six. Um, that'll divide nicely, okay? That can work. Is there an easier thing to do than that? Still correct, do it if you like. I'm going to recommend the easiest path. Now you do the same thing. You, the, the thing about putting zero in for x is that it got rid of this term. If we put zero in for y, it'll also get rid of this term. And we'll just solve for x. So this goes away if we put a zero in for y. That goes away. 2x equals negative 12. Divide by 2, we get negative 6. So negative 6, 0. 0, 2. Okay, and then this one real quickly, y equals negative 2. Just to clear up this possible horizontal vertical mix-up that happens to plenty of people. Um, where on a graph, right, an, an xy coordinate graph, um, where is y equal to negative 2? Where in the graph is y equal to negative 2? Even one place where it's equal to negative 2? Where? Zero, negative 2. Yeah, there's a, a, a point zero, negative 2. Okay. Down here, right? If we want to get to y is negative 2, we can come down here. Down, that's vertical. Um, that's the y direction. If we want always y to be equal to negative 2, we have to stay down there. We can't go anywhere else but down there. So all along here, at that quote unquote height, we'll see that y is equal to negative two. Whether we're over here at <coughs> negative four, negative four, negative two, or over here at five, negative two, we're going to be at y is negative two. So, are there any questions from the quiz or any questions from some other part? of the homework that you found at all confusing.
Okay, so this is uh, any method you choose. You could choose, well, just find two points, really. Like anything you want to do to find those two points will be just fine. Also something you could do. Okay, put a zero in for what? For y, okay. Put a zero in for y, that gives us negative 5.5x equals six. So we just need to divide by negative 5.5 on both sides. X equals, well, I don't Wait, know. Wait, question. So question. How, I, how I did it in my digital fiber, right, was like, I just added 5.5x on both sides and then got like those decimal pairs that form. Does that work? You got what now? Like that's right. Yeah. Did that work? Um, okay. Well, sure. I mean, as long as you add the same thing to both sides, you can do whatever you want. What did you do after that? Um, just plotted it, like, went up six, and then... So y intercept of six? Yeah. Okay, so... I just plus two, two, three, four, five, six, yeah? Then what? And then up five more, and over one. Up five and over one? Five and a half. Five and a half? One, two, three, four, five, six and a half, and over one, certainly. That would work just fine. Oh, hold on. Yeah, yeah. There we go. That works just fine. We can write any number as over one, and we get to get the rise over the run. That'll work just fine. Um, over here, we can solve for x, which this comes out to be uh, 6. Five. That doesn't look so good. Okay, so if I got in that position, I might say, mm, I don't know, if I want to stick with this idea. You could try and graph negative 1.09090909, but then it's, it's not quite as accurate as you'd like to do. Um, maybe we could also come over here, and rather than using 5.5, which is fine, we could also. Uh, change it to y equals, and then take 5.5 as a fraction, like a, an improper fraction. What would 5.5 be as an improper fraction? Huh? That would be a mixed number. Oh. Just as a single fraction, what would 5.5 be? 5.5, yeah? So 11 over 2. 11 over 2. If you divide 11 by 2, then we get 5 and a half. Half of 10 is 5, half of 1 and a half, so 5 and a half. So 11 halves x plus 6. Oh, I put it in the pool. Yeah. Should be plus. So here, again, we have the y-intercept of 6, and then we just basically would do what you did, but twice. Like we go 5 and a half, 5 and a half more, so that we're right at 11 above that and go over 2. But that's going to make the same line, so whatever. It all works out. If you do something like this on a test or something like that, just be really good about putting the dots exactly where they should go. If they're slightly off, then you convince me you don't know what you're doing. But if you do very clearly go up to five and a half above this mark, and make sure you're at a half, halfway between two things, then I'm convinced. You get that there's this input-output thing. Okay, you need to find two points and connect the lines, or dots. Any other questions from the homework? Total cost in dollars, uh, cost Y in dollars of a gym membership after X months is given by this equation. So the cost in dollars, Y, is given by 45X, X being the number of months that you've been there. 75. Graph the equation. What is the total cost of the membership after nine months? I'm going to graph this equation. How do we graph this equation? What, what form is it in? Standard? It's not standard. Uh, uh, we got the slope here and the uh, y intercept. And y equals mx plus b. So 
Uh, well, we're going to graph this. These are pretty big numbers, so we just need to make sure that we label it correctly, stay to scale uh, to some degree. So 75. Let's just stop there for a second. So what does y represent? Sum of the whole thing. Sum of these two things, yes. When you add those two together, what does it mean in the context of this problem? It equals y. Which y. represents? How much, money. How much money? How much you spend in dollars? Uh, okay, they spend in dollars on what? What are you spending money on? Gym membership after X months. After X months. So how many months is this? How many months have we been going to the gym at this point? Zero months. So zero months, how much have we spent? So what could you... Say about this gym membership. <laughs> it's expensive. How does it work? Like, That's the initial price. Okay, so you, you walk in the door and before you lift a single weight, you're going to pay $75. Like, I don't know what all that money goes to because. Where is all that? Some, some gym memberships cost $200 to start with. How much does it cost to file some paperwork? get you a card of some kind so you can come in. I don't, it doesn't cost $200, it shouldn't cost $75. person enters it in the computer, they print it out, give you your key card or whatever, it should be done. So I'm not sure what's going on there. It's kind of a racket. Okay, so what now? How do we get to the next point on the graph or some other point on this line? Could you guys stop talking so much to just each other, face forward, like second grade? So how do we get another point on this line? Up 45 over 1. That's our slope up 45 over 1. So this is 75. So this is 100. Let's see, up 45. This is 25. So 25, maybe 45 over 1. So we just need to mark the scale. This is months. And this is dollars. So how much are we spending per month? 75 bucks, maybe. Not quite. Oh, 75 bad. is what we pay oh, up front. How much do you pay per month? 45. 45, the slope of the line. That's the rate you're paying. $45 per month. Right. So then how are we going to figure out how much we are spending on this membership after nine, nine months? Plug nine into X. We're going to be there for nine months. That goes right there. Forty-five times nine months plus always seventy-five because you've already always spent seventy-five dollars no matter how many months you've been there. So forty-five times nine. Four hundred five. Seventy-five. Four eighty. Yeah, that's what it says. Yeah. Four hundred eighty. All right, well, let's have your homework passed in then. I just want to make sure everybody understands that 
if you have makeup work or late work, don't turn it in right at the time that I take homework. Always put anything that is not due currently over there in the back, in the bottom of your bin, anywhere it's labeled out to class to begin. Okay. That's that. Commercial. Um, I'm going to share a video or two with you. And uh, I'm going to lose my. <laughs> okay, so this is a, a guy. He has a channel called Veritasium, and he just makes uh, videos to try to educate people about science. Okay, so I'm going to show you a video. It's like an example of his style of teaching, in a way. Okay, we'll talk about it. I'll watch another video. Trees are some of the biggest organisms on the planet. But where do they get that matter to grow? It's nutrient saving grain. It's that soil, isn't it? Yeah. Goodness out of the soil, I suppose. It comes out of the soil. Yeah. So notice he's just asking people randomly, where do trees get their mass? Where does all their size and you know stuff come from? Yeah. Goodness, goodness. Mm. Why isn't there a big hole around the tree where it's taken out all the soil? Because it doesn't say gradually that the soil has time to recover. <laughs> <laughs> now I think it's intuitive to believe that the tree gets most of its mass from the soil. Because you can see those roots digging into the soil and they must be taking something out of there. And I mean, a tree looks like dirt and it feels solid like dirt. But it's not. In the early 1600s, a scientist named Johann Baptista van Helmholt tried to figure out where the mass of a tree was coming from. So he got a pot of soil and very carefully measured the amount of soil in there. Then he planted the tree and took care of it for five years, making sure that no soil left or was added to his pot. And at the end of this experiment, he weighed the tree to find that it was 72 kilograms, but the mass of soil had only decreased by about 60 grams. This was pretty strong evidence that the mass of the tree does not come from the soil. I've never thought about that, actually. Well, because they don't really eat anything. Trees. They, they don't, don't eat me. No, no. They don't eat anything. Water is all they absorb. That's all they eat? Yeah. They don't eat anything else? No. That's all they eat? Well, presumably from the water and the nutrients from the soil. Is there anything else that you need besides the soil and the water? I suppose it's all you need, isn't it? To make uh, other, other than the original seed. For, for that particular tree. The right? seed and the soil and the water and that makes this big tree. Ooh. Of course, Johann Baptista van Helmholt did conclude that the tree was made entirely of water. Now, while that's not correct, at least he was on the right track, realizing that the matter of a tree doesn't come out of the soil. The sun energy, yeah. The sun energy? Yeah. Are they converting energy into mass? Or... Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I don't like know. Like, there, there, there wasn't stuff and then there was. Like, where did that stuff come from? <laughs> I don't know about you. My question is, where do they get that mass to grow big? Sun. It's from the rain and the sun, presumably. Light. The sunlight. And the sunshine. The sunshine? Does the, does the sunshine add mass to the tree? Um, well, it, yes, it wouldn't, they wouldn't grow without it. I don't know whether it adds mass, but they wouldn't grow without it. Of course, the sun's energy is needed for the tree to build the matter into its branches and leaves. But the sun itself, the energy, is not matter. Well, I suppose we put air into this as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's got to be something out of the, uh, you know, what is a, gas, the a gas in the air that it needs as well. Oxygen. The trees need the oxygen. Yeah, the, the oxygen, don't they? And uh, I guess oxygen. The oxygen, of course. The oxygen? Are there any ingredients that we're missing? Um, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. So CO2. would it surprise you to find out that 95% of a tree is actually from carbon dioxide? Trees much, are largely yeah. made up of air. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I need the tree like, oh, holy <laughs> <laughs> So as it turns out, trees are mostly made out of air, out of the carbon dioxide that they take in. 
And what's interesting is that we breathe out carbon dioxide and water. That's how we lose mass. But it's the exact same substances that trees breathe in to gain mass. So if you can imagine a closed system where it was just you and a tree, you would breathe out that carbon dioxide and water, the tree would take it in, so you would get smaller while the tree is getting bigger. And in a sense, you're becoming the tree. Okay. Let me show you another one. Just the, just the first part. I'll ask you first. Uh, uh, calm down. Um, how long does it take the Earth to go around the sun? Okay. Um, here it is. I'm a student at the Wright oh, University. Gosh. When I finish my degree, a new job at a great company. That's the great. How long does it take for the Earth to go around the sun? Well, a day. Yeah? 24 hours? <laughs> Obviously, a day, yes. A day, I hope. I know it takes uh, 90 minutes for the space station to go around the Earth. <laughs> no, one day. Is it one day? I don't know. What is it? <laughs> so, one year? Oh, like a year. Uh, a year. One year. Months. Months. Are you having 65? 365. 365. 365. 365. 365. 365. 365. 365. 365. 365. 365. 365. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Somewhere between that. It's not quite precise, is it? 365 and a bit days. Nearly 365. 365. 365. Hey, the other doesn't take one day to get around the sun. It takes only a year. <laughs> okay. So here's what I want to ask you. Let's go back. Okay. So this guy does this a lot. He goes out and he asks people questions. How do the people, in particular, like the people we asked about the Earth border on the sun, how did they look? You knowing that it takes a year. Two years. Two years. Okay. So he, uh, and it's, it's maybe they're like the, the guys at the end. They just forgot. And they're like, oh, wait, oh, no. I see what you're saying. Around the sun, a year. Okay. And probably when he told the rest of the people, they were like, Oh, right, a year. I just misspoke. Something like that. And maybe some of them thought it was a day, and then they had something to learn. <laughs> okay? Well, here's the thing. Um, uh, for as long as I've been teaching, and as long as I've seen teachers teach, uh, the attitude of a lot of students is, I don't know. Why don't you just tell them? Right? People don't, if they don't know how long it takes you to go around the sun, you just go up and tell them that it takes a year to get around the sun, and then what? Forget it. They might forget it, right? They might forget it. The learning that they did might not be as significant, okay? This, uh, he has another video that I won't show because it has a little bit of language in it, but you're free to go watch it yourself. Uh, it's a conversation between him and YouTube, okay? And it's a lot of the YouTube commenters saying, why are you such a jerk to these people? You just go up to them and you ask them, you know, what's a tree made of? And they look dumb. Uh, or, uh, you know, what's water made of? Or which one of these two things is colder? And the questions that he asks, you could think, hey, you're making these people look dumb. If they don't know, why draw it out? Why keep asking them questions? Why not just tell them what they're misunderstanding, right? As soon as you know it, just stop them and just tell them the, the truth. Or just walk up to people and say, this is the way it is. Michael? They're not going to remember it that way? Yeah, probably. Wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't that seem cockier, though? A guy just walking around telling people what they don't know? True, right? And they just walk up and he's like, hey, trees, they're made of carbon dioxide. Right? And he walks <laughs> away. <laughs> okay? But he comes up and he asks you questions about this thing, 
uh, and he has the uh, the advantage of being able to always choose his own subjects and choosing always interesting subjects, or at least ones that he can edit to make people look like they're interested in. Uh, or here's a video about uh, how far away is the moon from the Earth, okay? All right. We can watch this one, like just like the first part of it for... We know you like watching Team Peel on YouTube, but you'll love watching the whole show even more on Comedy Central. Yeah, let's watch that. Nope. Now tell me, uh, what does the moon do? Uh, the moon orbits the Earth. I don't see that much. Let's, let's right. do an orbit. Can we do an orbit? Yeah, so this is the wrong one. So, there's another video where it's the same basketball and tennis ball, and he asks people, how far away, if this is the Earth and this is the moon, how far away is the moon from the Earth? And so they'll be like, this far, this far, some really close, some really far. And he lets them think about it, struggle with it for a second, uh, or a minute or longer. And then they talk about how far it actually is from the moon. So a lot of people say it's about this far from the moon. It's actually probably like twice as far away as these people back here are. To scale, it's that far away. Right? If he just ran up to people, he'd seem very cocky and weird to just say like, here, hold this, I'm gonna run over here, that's how far away the moon is from the Earth. He tries to engage them and ask them questions and see what they think about it beforehand. Okay? So, uh, so like I said, he gets this criticism and people are like, why are you such a jerk to these people? You make a lot of people look dumb. Okay? Uh, and you can watch that video and some people, it looks like he is, like picking on them and making them look dumb. He's like laughing, but he's, he's not laughing because he thinks they're dumb. He's laughing because he's kind of excited that he gets to teach them something new. All right? So, you might think, like, yeah, I don't like that. I don't like when teachers don't just, I, I get that comment. I don't know what the answer is. The students saying to me, I don't know, why don't you just tell me? Okay, if you, if you wanna wait a few weeks and then wait till the moment when I ask a question, you wanna get a laugh, say that, because it usually gets a laugh. Well, I don't know, what, why don't you just tell me, okay? But I have reasons for doing it that way and they're a lot like his. So um, I'm going to play another video for uh, right here, it works. Let me explain that skepticism. I wrote my PhD thesis on how to create films to teach science, specifically physics. In a typical study, students accessed a website where they took a multiple choice pretest. The questions were something like, consider a basketball player shooting from the free throw line. After the ball leaves his hand, the force on the ball is A, upwards and constant, B, upwards and decreasing, C, downwards and constant, D, downwards and decreasing, or E, tangent to the path of the ball. What do you think? E, D. E. Upwards and decreasing. So he's pushed it, so the force, it, the only force, as it, after it's out of his hand, the only force acting on the ball is upwards, and then it like starts to slow down because this force becomes smaller. Okay. Yes. That's what you think? Okay. Anybody think something else? Could be E. Could be E. Could be tan so change it to the ball. The path of the ball would mean, like, kind of how it would feel to be on the basketball. You feel like you're going this direction. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the force is always pushing kind of on the back side of the ball. Okay. Any other ideas? D. D. Downwards and decreasing. Okay. Pushing down, but but less and less downward as time goes on. Okay. So these are ideas. One of them's correct, the other ones are not. All right, so. Take a minute to think about which answer you would pick and what you think most other people would pick. After the pretest, students were randomly assigned to see one of several online videos. The videos contained correct answers to many of the pretest questions. For example, here's a clip. Now consider a case where gravitational force is the only force acting on an object. While a juggling ball is in the air, we'll ignore air resistance because it's so small. Only one force acts on the ball throughout its flight. This is the force of gravity, which is constant and downwards. Gravity accelerates the ball in the downwards direction. After being thrown up, a ball travels slower and slower upwards. Its velocity goes through zero, and then it speeds up in the downward direction. The whole time the ball is accelerating downwards, then it meets the juggler's hand. Immediately after watching the roughly 10 minute video, 
the students took exactly the same test. I also interviewed some students to see what they thought of the video. The most common comments were that it was clear, concise, and easy to understand. The students also increased their confidence in the correctness of their answers compared to the pretest. So what about how much they learned? On the pretest, the average score was 6.0 out of 26. And after the video, the average was 6.3. Well, what was going on? I dug deep in interviews to find out. It turned out students did not even correctly remember what was presented in the video that they had seen a few minutes earlier. One recalled, in the video it said the ball is slowly decreasing in force, so therefore it stops at one point and then comes down. What was worse, another told me, it wasn't that hard to pay attention to because I knew already what she was talking about. I hadn't told them about the 6 out of 26 yet. So I was listening, but I wasn't really paying utmost attention. What can be done about this? Perhaps videos are just too passive a medium to attract attention for 10 minutes, even when you know you're being interviewed after. But I see the problem a different way. Typically, we think of education as informing students about things they uh, are not aware of, like the French Revolution, for example. But science presents a different challenge. It is not that students know nothing about it, but that they already have plenty of ideas, most of which are, unfortunately, wrong, scientifically speaking. They don't pay attention because they think they know it. And then when asked what they saw, they falsely remember their own ideas as what was presented. Is there a way to overcome this? Well, I thought students might pay more attention and be able to understand if their ideas were presented in the video. So one of the other videos involved an actor pretending to be a student with the most common misconceptions, which were illustrated. Okay, so don't say it out loud, but think to yourself, you know, what would you say now about the force in the ball after it's been thrown in the air? Is it up and constant? Is it up and decreasing? Is it tangent to the ball? Is it down and constant? Is it down and decreasing? Right? After having seen the, the video before, do you think any differently? What, what did the video inform you of? So don't say it out loud, but just think about it. Okay? I wonder, does everyone in here understand? Because right? we've got lots of answers. Some of you have to be wrong. Right? Actually, none of you have to be right, because maybe you didn't say the right answer. And then when you watch that video, did it change your mind? Do you now know what the force is? Or maybe would this be more helpful? Can you tell me what happens when a single ball goes around one? Well, Luke's hand gives the ball a force that drives it upwards against gravity. But as it goes up, this force gradually dies away until at the very top, it perfectly balances gravity. And then gravity wins and the ball falls down. Hmm. He then discussed with the other dialogue participant why the misconception didn't work and how the scientific idea differed. In interviews with students who watched this video, no one used the words clear, concise, or easy to understand. Most often, they said it was confusing. But on the post-test, the average score nearly doubled to 11 out of 26. When asked to rate how much mental effort they invested in watching the videos, Students who saw the dialogue with misconceptions averaged a whole point higher than those who saw the explanation without misconceptions. And it seems like it worked. That increased mental effort translated into more learning. So with the Veritasium films, I always try to start with the misconceptions. How long does it take for the Earth to go around the sun? Well, a day. Obviously a day, yes. This is uh, representing the Earth. Okay. Ooh. And this represents, what do you think? Yes. How far apart uh, are they? Like, roughly. Like roughly. Not that much. Is the following statement true or false? Okay, you must stop right there. And um, just get to my point about that. He spends his time at the beginning of his lesson asking these people, "What do you basically? What do you think you know about the subject already?" Okay. Um, well, he certainly is not going to include the people who just stand there and say nothing. No. Probably not a lot of people who just stand there and ignore him if they could read the talk to him in the first place. Um, he's going to put the, the ones in there who are giving some kind of answer, they're giving some kind of feedback. This is what I think about that subject. Right? Math is the same way. Math is a science. You do have conceptions of how numbers interact with each other, and some of them are wrong. And that's why I ask you questions 
that you may feel like, I don't know the answer to that. But you know something about it. You know about multiplication, addition, subtraction, and so on. And you have an idea of the thing that I'm asking you. Okay? So I'm going to ask you a question, and you will most likely, or, or the class most likely, will give a wrong answer. Okay? But it's also likely that it's going to be an answer that a lot of people would give, right? Where does the mass of a tree come from? Um, I don't know, water, dirt, okay? If you don't know where that mass comes from, you might think that. Water, dirt, you hear these answers, you hear yourself, you project yourself into that situation. When somebody else, else gives the answer that you would give, you're like, yeah, okay, that's what I think it is, okay? And when you are told, no, actually, this is the way that it is. Actually, the mass of the tree comes from CO2. Actually, the square root of negative four doesn't exist. When I ask you what's the square root of negative four, and you say, it's negative two. And then I say, well, no, think about this. This is why it's not negative two, okay? If I just walk up to you and say the square root of negative four doesn't exist because these reasons, it's gonna be less significant, right? So don't be afraid to participate. Your participation makes this class more interesting and fun and also more significant to your learning. And the people who participate more learn more and more significantly, okay? So, don't think that my job is to come and inform you of things that you're, you have no idea of. It's to, a lot of times, come in and fix misconceptions and then try and go deeper and uh, have a stronger, deeper understanding of the things that you feel like you already know. All right, so participate, ask questions, just offer something up. Don't just sit there and wait for me to come alongside you and say, here's the answer, because you, you may get some knowledge that way, but he's done his research, he got his PhD on this stuff. That turns out not to be as significant. So if you participate, if you at least listen and, and pay attention and hear what other people are saying, that's significant. If you offer up your own answer sometimes, uh, it's gonna be even better, okay? Um, and I'd also recommend watching that other video, it's Veritasium, and, and maybe look for uh, I think the title of it is YouTube or something like this. It's him sitting down with a, you know, he taped it twice. He's wearing a YouTube shirt in one of the one side of the conversation, and then he's himself on the other side of the conversation, and uh, he just kind of reads some comments and addresses those concerns. Um, and that's my philosophy as well. That we need to start with misconceptions. Uh, like when we take the homework quizzes, that's another way of doing that. You may think on your homework that you know what you're doing, and it turns out you don't. And that's why I make you do it on your own so that there's another way for you to see like, oh, turns out I don't quite know how to graph this line. It turns out I don't quite know how to find slope. I didn't understand that. And we start with your misconceptions every day and then clear them up and then we move on. Okay, so it's the whole idea. And I'm not alone in that. There's a doctor out there who thinks the same thing. <laughs>